know, um, I attended Nate's campaign announcement in Lewiston back in January. I left the restaurant that day knowing that Nate is the type of person I want representing me in Washington. Some of you here tonight were at that January event. Some of you are here because you're curious about Nate, while others are here because they were encouraged to come with a friend. Nate can tell you his story. Nate can tell you his story better than me. And once you hear it, you'll know that he's the right person at the right time to represent us in the U.S. Congress. Van Jones, a well-known commentator and CNN host, said recently, there is no blue wave without blue work. There is no blue wave without blue work. The wave doesn't have to be just blue. Our congressional district, district number 27, is gerrymandered, purple in parts, and he with heavy doses of red. I am a Democrat who won elections in purple and red towns. I am a Democrat who believes your district's needs and interests come first. I am a Democrat who knows that candidates like Nate McMurray don't often come along and when we are fortunate to have someone like him willing to stand up for us, then we have to stand up for him. <laughs> Nate will win because a legion of people believe that his message of fighting for families, fighting for farms, fighting for health care, fighting for our environment, fighting for our rights, crosses political labels. Nate wins because it's not about being red or blue. It's about bringing civility, accessibility, hope and prosperity to a district. It's about Democrats admitting, as Van Jones says, that the economy is coming up, but we don't want society coming apart. I appreciate each and every one of you being here tonight. Nate has a heavy schedule of events and appearances from now until Election Day. From now until Election Day, more rallies and fundraisers are being planned to raise Nate's profile and help him get his message out to the masses. I want to mention one event in particular because I'm involved with it. I'm helping host a uh, fundraiser for Nate on August 23rd in Wilson uh, with Jamie Moxham at Jamie Moxham's home. Uh, please see me later for details, but I'm hoping that if you're available and you can attend it, either that or any of the other, main, uh, any of the other many uh, events and appearances that are being hosted for Nate, please, please try to be there. Uh, I, I see an opportunity here tonight, not just for this rally, but for all those to come forward, for all the other events coming forward. I see more and more people being engaged in this coming election for this particular congressional district. I see and talk to people on both sides of the aisle who are disappointed and upset with the state of affairs in this country and are looking for somebody that's honest, that's good, that will tell things the way that, that, they, that they are, that will put the interest of this district first. And in that person, we're fortunate to have someone like Nate McMurray who's willing to step in Without further ado, it is my great pleasure to, to introduce Nate McMurray, our next United States Representative. Now, Nate doesn't need the box. <laughs> Thank you, Francine. Uh, Francine is an amazing speaker. I mean, you can see when she got up to her, the way she greeted everybody, all the dignitaries, the way she handled it. She's obviously a pro, and for her to talk like that about me is humbling. I'm grateful. We know how long she served this community. We know what she has done. We know what type of person she is and what kind of values she has. So can I get a round of applause for her? I'm so grateful to be Now, first of all, thank you to all of you. 
Uh, you never know how many people are going to come out to these things. And, you know, I usually go in with low expectations. Maybe we'll have three, five, who knows. But we have a full room here. We're live streaming this. Everyone give a loud cheer so they can see how full it is. So I want to talk a little bit about who I am. Now, some of you have met me before. I've talked about my story before, but I talk about it a lot because my background motivates why I'm in politics, why I'm here before you today, and why I want to do this, and why we're going to win. So I grew up, this is my home. I'm not far from here. I could walk to my childhood home from where I grew up, where I grew up right from here. I grew up in North Tonawanda. I know some of you are from North Tonawanda. Can I get a round of applause for North Tonawanda? Thank you. I grew up in North Tonawanda. My dad, he built houses all over Niagara County. He was a drywall guy. He was in the painters union. He was uh, tall and handsome. He was a baseball player. But I never knew my dad. My dad died when he was 39 from cancer. He was exposed to fumes, and there was a different era back then. So my mom came home to that big house in North Tonawanda on the canal, and she had to greet seven children as a 35-year-old woman with no education and figure out a way to raise those seven children by herself. And it wasn't easy. You can imagine the things that went through her head. She, could, she told me that she couldn't believe that it was real, that she thought she'd see my dad somewhere when she was out on the road. She thought maybe she would run into him. She couldn't believe he was gone. But she did a great job by raising us. We went through a lot of the trials and tribulations that I see all across NY27. I've been to every inch of this district, from Albion to Warsaw to Akron. I've been there, and I see people are struggling. Doesn't matter if they're Republicans or Democrats, most people in this region are living paycheck to paycheck. Many of us in this room are living paycheck to paycheck. And I understand what that means and the trials and tribulations that go along with that. So that's why I'm here. Now I worked my way up. I went to college. I started at community college. I'm proud of starting at community college. How many of you started at community college? <laughs> started at community college, did well. Some teachers saw they had a, I had a spark in me and they pushed me harder. I'm so grateful for public schools and for those teachers at a public community college that pushed me. I went on to UB. I graduated with honors from UB. I went on to law school in California. Graduated, got a scholarship, a Fulbright scholarship. I studied overseas in Asia. I received another scholarship to study in China. I learned I had a language ability. I learned I could speak Mandarin. I learned to speak Mandarin. I learned to speak Korean. I was spent years overseas as a, as a lawyer working some of the biggest law firms in the world with kids from the most prestigious prep schools in the whole, in the whole world, in London and in the United States. But I was that kid from North Tonawanda. And I'm still that kid from North Tonawanda. And I'm always going to be that kid from North Tonawanda. And I'm always going to fight for the things that matter to families in Western New York. So how did I? So how did I, how did I get started in politics? Well, I tell the story all the time because it's, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> I came home back to Western New York because I missed Western New York. I missed this place. You guys know what Niagara County's like. I used to dream about Niagara County. I used to dream about the falls in Niagara County when I was overseas. I dreamed about Lake Ontario in the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the winter. I remember I used to drive up to Lake Ontario as a kid with my buddy's junky car, and we'd sit by the water, and we'd look out at, at Toronto in the distance. And it would look like a little Oz sitting out in the distance, and you think of the possibilities that were out there. I remember going to pumpkin patches around here with my family and my friends as a kid. I remember playing sports around here, playing pickup basketball in people's backyards just in this neighborhood. And I wanted my kids to have that experience. So I brought them home. And I did something in my career, and I was in the paper, and lo and behold, I got a letter in the mail. The letter was from the Democratic Party. It said, we see that you're a Democrat. You were in the paper. If you want to get involved in politics, please come visit us. It was from Jeremy Zellner, the chair of the Erie County Party. So I said, well, I'll go see Jeremy. I went to his office. Now, he denies this story happened, but I'll take a lie detector test, it happened. <laughs> I went to his office with a letter, I said, hey Jeremy, I'm ready to serve, what do you want me to do? And he looked at me in the eyes and said, you're the first person to ever answer one of those letters. 
So I quickly realized that I needed to figure out, well, what, well, maybe this is not a good thing. And he said, no, 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 no. Go to Grand Island and meet Jim Sharp. He's the party chair out there. Now, earlier, Francine said that people who run the local parties are the backbone of the Democratic Party and the backbone of local politics. I know that to be true. And first of all, before I go any further, thank you to those who helped me gather signatures. Thank you to those who fought for me during the last six months. Thank you to those who came to Lewiston. How many from Lewiston here today? Thank you for those who Lewiston who were there when I kicked off my campaign. And again, I didn't think anyone was going to come. And we had, how many people did we have? Several hundred people. And it's been like that throughout the campaign. But it happens because we are not top down. We are bottom up. We are leading from the grassroots. And that's real for our campaign. So I met another grassroots leader, a guy named Jim Sharp. And I always talk about him because he and I become like brothers. We have gone through battles together. Three years ago, I didn't know who the guy was. But since then, we have spent so much time together. <laughs> Jim. So I went to go see Jim at Democratic Party headquarters on Grand Island, which is that little Wendy's by the roundabout there off the, off the throughway. <laughs> so I met Jim at Democratic Party headquarters. And I said, Jim, I got humbled by Jeremy, but what do you want me to do? I'll lick envelopes. I'll do whatever you want to do. I think it'd be a good way to connect to the community. I want to give back. And Jim looked at me and said, I want you to run for supervisor. I said, Jim, are you crazy? How am I going to win as supervisor? I can't win. Nobody knows who I am. I have no political experience. And he said, well, it's either you or me. And I already ran three times. <laughs> so, I, so I told Jim, all right, I'll go, I'm going to do it. So I threw my hat in the ring, and we fought hard. And I fought loose. And sometimes when you play loose, you do a little bit better in life. You don't, you're, not, you're not so worried you're going to make a mistake. And lo and behold, I won. Now, some of you may know, I won by two votes on election night. Turned out to be 14 votes after the final count and tally months later. But I'm all, and trust me, every single person I ran into in Grand Island that likes me since then told me I was those two votes. And, <laughs> but the point of the story is, those efforts matter. Every vote counts. Now, we may be in that two vote situation again in November. And that's not because I'm such a great leader. I've done my best as a local supervisor. I've put my heart and soul into it. Some people like me, some people hate me. But I've done my best, and I think we've got a record that I'm very proud of, a record of green energy, a record of con conservation, a record of millions of dollars in investment. Chris Collins calls me a radical, but I've had a balanced budget three years in a row, and I've worked in the private sector my entire life. I know how to balance a budget. <laughs> So we did all those things because of those two votes and those grassroots efforts. We did all of that. So how did I get in this race against Chris Collins? I think this is a dire time for our country. It's a dire time for our country. Let's forget about collusion, all that other stuff, which drives me crazy, by the way. If you're happy the way our president acted in front of Kim Jong-un, I'm not. Are you very happy if the way the president acted in front of Vladimir Putin? You can make any excuse you want. You can spin it any way you want. It's a disgrace. But we are in a dire time in another way. Things are out of balance. You can feel it, right? You wake up in the morning and you have that strange feeling in your stomach that this isn't normal. That maybe America is not going to be the America we're proud of tomorrow. That maybe things are changing for the worse forever. And you feel that. We need to stop it now. In, 19, in 1968, the average difference between the wage of a CEO and the average worker was 20 to 1. Today, it's about 400 to 1. The increase in CEO pay since 1968 is almost 1,000%. The increase in worker pay is about 10%. The average worker in America has far less buying power today than they did in 1975. You can feel it. You can also see it in the way you live your life. LBJ talked about a great society, a great society where we can work together and we have time to reflect and take care of our, our families. Some of you are working so hard, you don't even have time to think. I think one of the reasons why we're in this mess as a country is because so few people vote. People do not even go out to vote, and it's not because they're bad people. It's because they're exhausted. 
They don't have time for vacations. They don't have time to read to their kids. And meanwhile, we're told over and over and over again about how great the economy is and how things are so great. Well, they're not so great for a lot of us. I'm the guy who worked dead-end jobs in Western New York, who fought his way through school, who was alone and abandoned for much of that time, who cuts his own grass. Who do you think is going to fight for you? Me or the guy worth $70 million and has all that stock in that pharmaceutical company in Australia? I'm... So let me, talk to, let me talk to you about him for a second. Now I'm going to get a little bit heated maybe. I'll try to control my temper. But let's talk about this guy for a second. I don't want to stand up here and tell you why I'm a better candidate than him, because he shouldn't even be a candidate. The, the message we need to send to every person, the Republicans, especially the Republicans, is do you think this is the guy that deserved your endorsement? With all the good people, the people who understand Western New York, do you think a guy from North Carolina who violated ethics rules, who voted on health care issues when he had health care stock, who told fellow congressmen that he was going to make them millionaires. Did he make any of you millionaires? No. Did he promise that he was going to try? No. How is this man even endorsed? There should be a backlash and a riot in the Republican Party against Chris Collins for even getting the endorsement. Now, now, some people say this, part, this race isn't worth winning. I'm going to tell you the truth. We are, we are doing this on a shoestring budget, but we're doing it. We're doing it. We're doing it, and we're going to town after town. We had almost 200 people at a banquet in Mount Morris. You ever been to Mount Morris? Yep. No offense to Mount Morris. We all know it's beautiful, but I'm... I'm not sure 200 people live in Mount Morris. It's, it's a small town. Don't, I shouldn't have said that. I'm going to get some hate mail. But it's a beautiful place. But to have all those people in that small town out, I was so excited. We had 85 people show up to a street event one day's notice in Canandaigua. We got the video to prove it with one day's notice. And they were on fire. The good news for me is I don't have the money to be Chris Collins, and I'm not sure. I, I was recently reading a book recently about dark money. Have you read that book, anybody? It's a great read. But that money, they talk about the challenge the Democrats are going to face going forward because of Citizens United and other cases. Now, there's an old adage. If you sell out financially, you sell out every other way. We have not sold out financially. We have not taken corporate money. I've taken money from people like you, people I believe in. Chris Collins says he's going to fight for his donors. Well, I'm going to fight for my donors, too, but the difference is you are my donors. When we, when we go to an event, we'll have 200 people, we'll walk away with 200 bucks. And guess what? I'm proud of those 200 bucks. It reminds me of the story of the Bible, the widow's might, and how precious those dollars are. I know how hard it is to give to a candidate, any candidate, and I know how hard this is. So when people say this is not a fight worth having, that they have an algorithm, or some computer program that says we can't win in NY27, because that's the message coming out of DC. We need to push back. I went to DC when I started this race after Lewiston. I went right to DC. And I said, are you guys going to help me out? And they looked at the, to they looked at the floor and they hemmed and hawed. And they said, look, it's, we don't think it's a winnable race. We looked at the numbers. And I said to them, you don't understand what it's like on the ground in NY27. You don't understand the anger against Chris Collins. And they said, yeah, we hear that all the time. If they don't care, we have to care. The man who was the first person to endorse our president, this president that anyone, I can tell you, if you, go, if you told, if there was an objective standard and they weren't, no one was watching, no matter who they are, they would tell you, I got some concerns about this guy. He is not normal. The first person to back the... <laughs> the first person to back that guy should not get coast, should not be able to coast back in because somebody in DC has an algorithm saying that they shouldn't put money into this race. So guess what we're gonna do? We're gonna lead them. You are gonna help me lead them. You're gonna stand up, you're gonna go to events like this, you're gonna tell friends, and every time you meet somebody and say vote for Nate McMurray, let's beat Chris Collins, you're gonna remember those two votes on Grand Island. 
and realize that every single one of those votes counts. So I'm having this thing, the two vote initiative. I want every single person to guarantee they're gonna bring two votes with them to a vote with them on November 6th. Help me out with it. Can you guys do that? This is not a poker game where we should allow politicians from Albany or DC to determine, well, this district's a giveaway, this district is a good district. We don't care about that poker game. We care about our home, and we want someone to represent us that we're gonna be proud of. I can tell you right now, I'm gonna make you proud. I'm a fighter, I'm not perfect. Anyone who's around me, listen, my campaign knows I'm not perfect. I got all kinds of flaws, I'm just like you. I'm a regular person with all the weakness and frailties that come with life. But guess what? My values are in the right place. I love my team. I love what they stand for. I love who they are. I have these young guys, these young guns. Look around, Every, these young men and women wearing the McMurray t-shirts. These are the people that believed in me from the beginning. These are the people who came to my early rallies and said, listen, we want to fight for you. And I'm so proud to know them, to be around them and they give me life and energy and vitality. There's one young man on my team, when I first met him, he was working at, uh, he's, not a, he's, not, he's okay with me saying this, he was working at a consumer uh, beverage place. And I met this guy, I'm like, this guy is wickedly smart. He knows policy better than the people I watch on cable news. And, and I realized it's the story of this generation. It's a story of maybe many of you, uh, some of you, and maybe your sons and daughters. There's not any opportunity. The lie that the economy is booming and, there's, and things are going great, it's going great on Wall Street. You know it's not going great here. You know it's not going great here. The last pitch I'm gonna make, and I'll take your questions, is we know what kind of country America should be. In our heart, we know what America is. America is great, but America also must be good. There have been many great countries in the history of the world. Rome was great, the Mongols were great. We can go through history and name a million powerful, powerful nations. But when Ronald Reagan talked about the city on the hill, he did not talk about a fortress on the hill. He talked about a country that was going to be a symbol of goodness and light and human dignity. Now, whether you believed in his policies or not, that's a beautiful notion and a beautiful thought. And it's something that we all think America should be. America should be great and good. And we want leaders that we're proud of and people we believe in. Now, I don't want to get over dramatic, but you can feel that feeling in your heart about wanting to be good. There's another feeling, the feeling of anger and hostility and rage. Now, some people want to tap into that energy, and that feeling, and that emotion. I want you to tap into something higher, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat or whatever you are. I want you to tap in the energy that this is a nation that we are proud of, that is good, that is dignified, and let's build that nation again. Yeah. <laughs> Socialism, that's wrong. How are we gonna pay for it? I'm no socialist. I don't know what I am. I'm a person who wants to fight for working families. And in a country that could spend $4 million an hour in Afghanistan for God knows what for 17 years, in a country that can give a th they create a $3 trillion deficit this year for the most elite among us to have a tax cut, for guys like Chris Collins to get another house, I think we could have figured out a way to pay for Medicare for all. And the same goes for loan forgiveness. We cannot burn, we have to invest in future generations. Let me give you, we think about the small pie in America. Well, let me tell you, as someone who's been overseas for a long time, we are competing against people all over the world. If you think the Chinese are not investing in their future by investing in their education, if you think they're burdening their young people in the same way we are with debts that they can never pay, in, 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 in indentured servitude, if you think the Europeans are doing that, they're not. We are burdening, if anyone who really knows business, and Chris Collins, if you're listening, if you really know business, the number one asset in business is what? Human capital, good talent. We need to create that good talent, that human capital, and that also goes for trade schools. 
We have not enough kids. So there, I, I talk to kids all over Western New York. There is a demand and a desire for these kids to learn trades, to work with their hands, to build things, to create the next level of American society. We're not investing in trade schools. We're not investing in community colleges. We're investing in scam private colleges like you know who had. We need to get away from that nonsense. Can you imagine how you'd feel if you graduated with hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt and you graduated from a non-accredited university that no one would respect? We have thousands and thousands of people in America that are going through that. We need to end all of that nonsense. What is, the, what is your experience with farming and farmers issues? Well, I think if there's anyone here from Grand Island, they would tell you. When I came into office on Grand Island in that small town, one of the first things I said is we need to help farmers. Now, I didn't think I was going to run for Congress in two years. I had no idea. I just knew it was the right thing to do. I knew the New York State Constitution valued farming as a top priority of our state. I knew that George Washington, after the Revolutionary War, was so concerned about the value of the property in western New York that he thought about sending up troops to guard it because our soil is so rich and beautiful. I say this all the time. You can go in your backyard and you can plant seeds and you can grow anything here. How many of you are growing zucchinis right now? <laughs> There's a lot of, trust me, my mom's giving me too many zucchinis. I'm like, we can't use these zucchinis anymore, mom. We can't do that in a lot of other places, not just in this country, but around the world. We have more arable land than anywhere else. This is the bread basket of the world. We need to leverage that position. How do we do it? We make farming a national security priority. You might be saying, well, you're, are you out of your mind? Well, it is a national security priority. If there is an emergency and we don't have strong farms here, where do you get your food from? And that's not some harebrained idea. That's what the farmers will tell you. We also need to figure out a way to get their workers here. They don't have enough people to run the farms. That isn't some leftist position. That is reality. Reality on the ground. On Grand Island, we, we created almost 100 agricultural districts. Almost 100 protected agricultural districts because we believe in farming on all levels. I believe in community backyard farming. If you want ducks in your backyard or chickens or whatever, that's your backyard. As long as it's safe and it follows New York State agricultural rules, I'm good with it. I believe we have to have a society that embraces food and food culture. And, and we have farming in every single inch of our society and we value farming. It's not something I'm saying to get votes. It's something I believe in my heart. We created a farmer's market on Grand Island. We never had one before. The group there was wanting to do it, and I said, I got your back. Now, it's struggling. It's doing, they're, they're having an activity right now, and I, I, they wanted me to be there. I said, hey, I need to be at a rally, but I'll be there soon enough. I love farming, and we need to value and protect our farmers. Right now, Chris Collins will say all day that he loves farmers, because he knows he can get some money from them, get some votes from them. But the reality is, if he loved them, would the Farm Bureau be sending out suicide prevention letters to farmers right now in Western New York? Do you know that's happening? They're sending out suicide prevention letters because so many of them are taking their lives because of the dire situation they're facing. I talked to a soybean farmer yesterday, or not yesterday, recently. He said to me that the tariffs are killing him. They're killing him. Now, tariff is a tax. It's a tax, we know that. The bottom line is, I will be there for farmers. Whether they're for me in this election or not, if I get, far, if I get backing from the farmers, they know deep down I'll be, for, I'll be there for them. I was written up by the Farm Bureau while I was a supervisor. They said, this is one of the ones we need to watch. He's got farmers back. Now, for political expediency, they don't say that now, I understand. But listen, I'm going to tell any farmer in this room or any farmer in the Farm Bureau, when I win, I will have your back. I believe in farming. Any other, any other questions? Any other questions? Yes, in the way, way back, and we'll take you in the middle back. Hey, I wanted to know your opinion on rent to work and how you do visualize getting rid of right to work will be on your agenda. Getting rid of right to work will be on my agenda. <laughs> right to work. I had an argument with a guy for about 45 minutes recently about how he thinks we need to fight for right to work. Now, this man was not exactly rolling in the dough. And I tried to explain to him over and over again, right to work really means right to fire you and treat you like garbage. 
There's no work involved in right to work. It's it's scam marketing. It, it's what it's what the National Republican Party does so well. They have tricked people through subtle phrases and, and other messaging to think that our party is not the party that represents working people. I go to meet union groups, and the union leadership is like, we are beside ourselves because some of our workers don't understand that these people are targeting them, that they're ruining workers, that they're ruining unions. Now, part of the problem is the Democratic Party. They made a deal with the devil in the 80s, and they turned their back on unions. They've also lost their way. Now, when I say this sometimes, people get mad at me, but I believe it in my heart of hearts. When I was a kid, my dad and my uncle and other union members, they wore their union jackets with pride. Guys who looked like me were proud to identify as Democrats. They were the Democrats of the New Deal. They were the Democrats of the Great Society. They knew that the Democrats had their back. Now, I don't know what happened in the last 30 years, but that identity has disappeared. It's faded. We need to go to people and first of all say with pride that we are Democrats. Because Democrats are the party of fairness. Democrats are the party that said, just because you're not the right gender, you shouldn't, it doesn't mean you should be, shouldn't be paid, you should be paid less. They're the party that says, this is an illegal war, you must stop it. They're the party that says, no one should discriminate you because of your race or national origin or religion. That's our party. We are the party of fairness. Now, some people listening this might say, no, we're not that party anymore. We're the party of something else. Well, guess what? Remember when I talk about grassroots? We're going to lead from the bottom. We're going to lead. We're going to lead the organization. We're going to tell those people in D.C. This is the message. Remember one thing that I say today. Remember this: We fight for the middle class, the middle class, the middle class. That's who we are. <laughs> Next question. Yes, yes. Any, you have, any other questions? Right there. Go ahead, Miss. No, with your hand up. Go ahead. I am pro-reproductive health. Look, and I say that boldly. Now look at I understand this is a sensitive issue. I understand many people have religious beliefs that conflict with that. But we have a nation of laws. And part of the laws say that we have a separation of church and state. That's an issue that should be decided by women, their families, and their doctors. I'm not someone who's going to come up here and pontificate about what I think should be the right standards for you or anybody else in this room. That's a decision that's a private decision for you, your family. And I'll fight to make sure you have the right to make that decision. I, <laughs> let me say this as well. Let me say this as well. On that issue, and many other issues, but on that issue in particular, we, uh, one of the reasons we've lost votes to people in our community, to working families, is because they have used that issue as a wedge against us. Now, anybody who knows anything understands that when any normal person goes through that type of difficult decision with reproductive rights, they don't take it lightly, that it's a very serious decision. It's not something that's flippant. But they've used that to draw a wedge between us and the people that we really fight for. And they use something else that I'm going to talk about. And this is powerful in this region, you all know it. And that's Second Amendment rights. Now, there are many, many people who will vote on that issue alone. They'll say, look it, we, I don't care what Nate says, he's got a D next to his name, he's gonna kick in the door and come down the chimney with Hillary and take our guns. <laughs> but we know it's not true. But no matter how many times I say it, they don't believe it. It's been great marketing. Now, what do I really feel about the Second Amendment? I'm an Eagle Scout. I grew, around, I grew up around people with guns. I'm the town supervisor on Grand Island. We have two gun ranges on Grand Island, right next to my house. I went to a wedding anniversary at a gun range on Grand Island recently. <laughs> I have no problem with sporting life or gun culture or any of those things. I have a problem with the NRA. The NRA, the NRA is, is lying to people, they're scaring people, 
They're using malicious tactics to, to, to rile people up and get people angry, get people to think that a man that with the ethical problems that Chris Collins has and the, and the issues that he has is going to represent you more than Nate McMurray is going to represent you, that he's going to understand the trial and tribulations you go through more than me. I talked about it earlier. 80% of the people in this region are living paycheck to paycheck. Have you ever heard Chris Collins talk about that? Ever? Have you ever heard Chris Collins talk about anything? That's a great point over there. <laughs> Let me go to that for a second. I need to get on a stage with Chris. Yes. Thank you. Listen, we're gonna get, we're gonna debate him. And listen, if you're part of an organization like the League of Women Voters or some other group, he can't say no to. Host an event. He shouldn't have a choice about whether he debates me or not. Part of, uh, part of being a public servant is meeting the public, okay? I am the town supervisor of Grand Island. Trust me, there are many nights where I didn't want to meet the public. <laughs> if I have to do it and you elected officials have to do it, don't you think our congressmen should have to do it? Yeah. This is a joke. The fact that he will not have a town hall, he says, well, bad people will come, people who are targeting me, people who have political agendas. Well, this is politics. <laughs> this is, this, people will have political agendas. You, he, he, we should have a, a place that has decorum and it's organized and, does, and it's done well. I don't want to have a screaming match with him. I, he'll favor a screaming match. He wants people to hear that noise and, and nonsense. I want to have a reasoned, logical discussion with him where I look him in the eyes in front of all the Western New York and I say, how can you run for office again given your ethical violations? How, how can you run for office given you have not served this community? Now, I saw him. You probably saw the article in the paper. I met him twice now. First time, he was as rude as it gets. Second time, I was a little more rude. But I, I looked at him, and I said, look it, are we going to have that debate? But I was going to be worse. I'm going to be honest. When he looked me in the eyes, I saw, despite all his money and all his power and all his rich friends and his contacts at Trump and his trips on the Air Force One, he's a human being. He's a frail, elderly human being. <laughs> and, and when I saw his eyes, I paused, because I felt the humanity in him for a second. And I'm a human, and I said, I don't want to hurt this man. <laughs> but the reality is, he needs to be held accountable. And the, and the way to hold him accountable is not an affair in Livonia. It's on a stage before the public, and it's in the ballot box on November 6th. So I'm going I'm to end now because I've been talking for a long time. But I am grateful that you came. I'm great to be, grateful to Indivisible Niagara for your support. I'm grateful to Chris Borgatti for your support. I'm grateful to Nancy Fisher. I'm grateful to all of you. I, listen, I'm very proud of what we're doing. We're doing this the right way, town by town, hall by hall, house by house. He is going to spend that $2 million to make me look like I'm some kind of, like I'm uh, Trotsky or something. He's going he's gonna to come at me and he's going to try to label me as some radical extremist that's trying to ruin Western New York. But I'm not. I'm an Eagle Scout from North Tonawanda who grew up to community college and worked my way up. I'm one of you. We are going to win together. This is a dire time for a country. We are at a crossroads. Who do we want to be on November 7th? Who do we want to be? <laughs> Do we want to, now fifth, I say this everywhere I go and it's been, it's been giving me a good response, I'm going to say it again, that before I have wonderful Teresa come up. Yes, I said wonderful Teresa. <laughs> the, the, we're going to say this again. Fifty years ago, our country was at another crossroads. Some of you were out there fighting back then. Maybe they called you a hippie. Maybe they called you a nut job. Who knows what they called you? But 50 years ago, we had an illegal war in Vietnam. <laughs> Martin Luther King was shot dead. RFK was shot dead. Our country was in a crisis. 1968 Democratic Party convention, there was riots in the streets. There was race riots across the country. People thought we would never recover. Meanwhile, we had 
the growing power of the Soviet Union pressing the United States. And we thought maybe this experiment, the great American experiment is gonna fail. But it didn't fail. People went out, they organized, they took action, they knocked doors, and they voted. And for a while there, it seemed like progress would happen forever. The Civil Rights Act passed. We were close to having an Equality Act for women. We made progress on reproductive rights. We made progress in a lot of ways. We, we were going the right direction. We had to do more for the middle class, but overall the country felt like maybe, maybe it was gonna work out. Now, we're not going that direction right now. So now it's your turn. You learn about those moments in history where people stand up and they say, I am gonna make a difference, I am gonna change, I am gonna fight. Well, this is your opportunity. This is 1968 all over again. So I'm gonna say it to you. Will you help me out? Will you be those two votes and will you help me out on November 6th? Yeah. Yeah. That was pretty good. I always say this, but that was pretty good the first time, but we're gonna do it one more time and I want everybody at home listening on the cameras I want everybody at home to hear it. Say it like it's 1968. Are you going to help me win? Yeah.